Let me go ahead and read. So Jeremiah chapter 1. Now, before we go over here, I want to ask you this really quick, all right? Now, ask yourself this question first, okay? Now, what if I were to tell you that today was going to be the best day of your life? Right? What if today was going to be the best day of your life? Well, the next question would be then, how would you prepare then for the worst? How would you prepare for the worst day of your life? Now, Martin Luther said, even if I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. That, that, that's pretty profound to me, you know, like if... If tomorrow was the rapture, if today was the rapture, you know what Martin Luther basically said? He said, I'd still be doing what I'm doing now. Because that shows that he's doing what he's supposed to do. Right? So Jeremiah chapter 1. And we'll go ahead and verse 1. And it says, The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the, eleventh, uh, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Right? So, you know, when you read these verses, you know, you're doing your daily Bible reading and all that stuff, and and let's be honest, when you guys are reading this, you know, like you want to get your 10 chapters a day in, you know what I mean? You want to get your chapter in, you want to just get through your Bible. But let me ask you this, how often do you really go through these verses and, and you really study the little details, right? Because God gives you a timeline, yeah, He's infinite, but then He still comes down to the finite level of, of time so that we can understand what's going on, right? So I want to go through these things. We're going to... Um, we're going to be going from 2 Chronicles to 2 Kings, so just go ahead and keep your fingers there. And we're going to go and talk about these four points in time which the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Right? So let me go ahead and pray really quick. Uh, God, my Father, I, I really just need you, Lord God. I'm nothing, Father, without you, Lord. And really, we're nothing without you, Lord God. And I just pray you'd even help me with this prayer now. And I just pray, Jesus Christ, please, for the filling power of your Spirit, God, as we go through your book today, Father. I prayed you'd show us, Father, through your Spirit, and I just pray you'd put me behind you, Father. I don't even know the words to say right now, so I just pray that you'd speak through me, Lord, and I pray that you'd be glorified and honored, Father. I pray, Jesus Christ, please, Lord God, I, I just need your help, Father. I'm nothing, Lord, but I just pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, if there's anything we get out of this today, that we'd understand the power of God um, so that we can understand the fear of the Lord. And uh, we love you, Father, and I just pray that uh, you'd be magnified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so the first thing we're going to look at is um, Josiah, right? So the Bible says that the word of the Lord came in the 13th year, in the 13th year of his reign, right? So let's go ahead, go to 2 Kings 21 really quick. We're going to have a preface about um, how Josiah came to be. 2 Kings chapter 21. Second Kings chapter 21. So if you guys ever read the Kings, you'll find that Judah and Jerusalem, they're fighting against each other and they're going up and down, doing right in the eyes of the Lord, doing wrong and all this stuff. And then we come to Josiah, but let's go ahead and look what happened before he came to rule, right? Gen uh, 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 19, and it says, Ammon was twenty and two years old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Meshulameth, the daughter of Haruz of Jopta, of J Jodba. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasseh did. And he walked in all the way that his father walked in, and served the idols that his father served, and worshipped them. And he forsook the Lord God of his fathers, and walked not in the way of the Lord. Verse 23, And the servants of Ammon conspired against him, and slew the king in his own house. And the people of the land slew all them that had conspired against King Ammon, 
And, in, uh, and the people of the land made Josiah his son king in his stead. Right? So you'll find that uh, after Ammon uh, rules, after what, two years, the people, they, they rebel against him and they conspire against him and he gets killed. Right? Now, chapter 22 of 2 Kings, you'll find here that Josiah begin, begins to reign. And look how old he is. Verse 1, it says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. Wow. Eight years old. What an amazing thing. Now go to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. 2 Chronicles chapter 34. So we're going to be talking about when the word of the Lord came. If I could just find it. Okay, so you'll find here, the first thing that you'll find is that at eight years old, Josiah begins to reign. So we got that down. Right? Now... 2 Chronicles chapter 34, you'll, you'll see the same thing. Verse 1, and it says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one in 30 years. Right? So you'll see this little timeline right here for Josiah. It's, it's a 31-year 30 uh, reign. And uh, it says, and he did that which was right in the uh, sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. Now we're going to go, we're going to jump ahead eight years. So it says, verse 3, And for in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of uh, David his father. So you'll find here, eight years later, he went from eight years old to being 16 years old. And what happens here is that he seeks after God. Wow, 16 years old and he's seeking after God. What an amazing thing. Okay. Now, again, this is just going to be really standard stuff. It's just a lot of information, but, on, but just good. go ahead and pay attention towards the end. It'll, it'll all connect. It'll, it'll be so much clearer, right? And, and the first four verses of, uh, of Jeremiah, will, it'll open so much more for you, Amen. right? Jeremiah, uh, I'm sorry, keep your hand at 2 Chronicles. Now, the next verse, or just keep going in verse 3, 2 Chronicles 34, verse 3, and then we'll jump ahead another four years, and it says, in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves, and the carved images, and the molten images, right? So you'll find here, go back to Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 20. We're going to go, we're going to stay in 2 Chronicles, 2 Kings, and Jeremiah chapter 1, okay? So just keep your hand, your bookmarks, whatever there. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. And then you'll see that, right? Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 2, it says, To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year. Okay, so what happened in the eighth year? He seeked after God. Now, four years later, he's uh, 20 years old. In the twelfth year, he begins to reign. And what does he do when he begins to reign? Or when he, he's reigning already in, in his twelfth year? He purges. He purges Israel. Now, if you guys read what goes on, he literally breaks down all the things, and he breaks down the groves and the images, and you'll find that Israel is basically being sanctified. Now, it says in Jeremiah 1 that he came in the 13th year. So you'll find here the word of the Lord came here in his 13th year right here. Good, right here. And this is when he, he starts. And at the start of when the word of the Lord came, Israel is getting purged. Israel's getting purged. Now, what happens when you purge, you know, your walk with the Lord and everything else? Your spiritual um, uh, prosperity is all the way up here. It's all the way up here. And Jeremiah saw Israel and probably at its highest ever, at its highest, besides when David was ruling or when, when Solomon was ruling as well. And he starts right there. Now, go to Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 6. And you'll see just a little uh, 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 Jeremiah's perspective here in the days of Josiah the king. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 6, we're just going to look at it briefly. It says, The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king. Right? So God is speaking to Jeremiah during this time. During that time, right? Uh, and it says, Hast thou seen that which... Ba uh, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon the high mount, every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. 
Now, God is telling Jeremiah, haven't you seen the sin of Israel? But what's going on at this very moment is that Josiah is literally purging. He's purging Israel. And yet God is still at his highest telling him that Israel is wrong. Israel is still doing wrong. But I thought Israel is doing really well during this time. Well, God, just, he doesn't just see the great. He doesn't just see the good things in your life. He sees the, the, the sin that you decide to turn yourself from and, and you don't repent from, right? Now, what happens, go back to 2 Chronicles 34. Again, this is all just standard information, historical information. So this is more of a historical teaching. Okay, 2 Chronicles chapter 34. We'll just go ahead and read again what's going on during the purging. Uh, Verse 4, and it says, what was going on in the 12th year? And it says, and they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence, and the images that were on high above, above them he cut down, and the groves, and the carved images, and the molten images, he break in pieces and made dust of them, and strode it upon the graves of, of them that had sacri- sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon the altars, and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh, and Ephraim, and Simeon, even unto Naphtali, and uh, with their mattocks round about, and when he had broken down the altars and the groves, and had beaten the graven images into powder, and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. So you'll see the purging here. What does he do? Um, he breaks down the altars of Balaam, the idols, the groves. He burns the bones, and he sprinkles all the things that he burnt on the graves of the people that were sacrificing unto these idols. It's pretty serious stuff, right? Now, look at verse 8. You'll, we'll jump ahead So this is another six-year span, right? What happens in the 18th year? In the 18th year, go back to Jeremiah really quick. We also skipped over something, if you guys ever read Jeremiah, and and really any prophet, you'll just tend to to glance over some interesting details that the Lord uh, chooses to put in. Now, it says right here in verse 1, Jeremiah 1.1, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, and again, when you're seeing uh, the, the, the lineage of these prophets, it's interesting to pay attention as well. You know, when you read 2 Chronicles and 2 Kings, you think it's really boring, but it, makes, it connects everything, and it makes, it makes more, uh, so much more sense, right? Okay, so you'll find out that he's the son of Hilkiah. Let me put that. Okay. Now, Hilkiah actually plays a big role, believe it or not, in Josiah's life. I know Sister Sheila already knows in the Bible game. All right, let's see where I'm at. Okay, so we'll find out from 2 Chronicles, just write this down, 2 Chronicles 34, verse 8, all the way to uh, chapter 35 to verse 19, you'll find that after, um, uh, basically, Josiah, he holds, he holds the Passover, because look what happens here in verse 8, 2 Chronicles 34, and verse 8, and it says, in the, now in the 18th year of his reign, see that, so now we're all the way over here. In the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, uh, the son of Azaliah, and Maaseiah, uh, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Jehoahaz, uh, Joahaz, the recorded to repair the house of the Lord his God. And when they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, Jeremiah's father, he comes into play. Guess what happens? They deliver the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites that kept the doors had gathered of the house of Manasseh and Ephraim and of all the remnant of Israel and of Judah and of Benjamin, and they return to Jerusalem. So what's going on is that, okay, now Israel is purged. Now they want to start building up, right? And in your Christian walk, before you even ever want to do more for God, you've got to purge everything out first. That's basically the spiritual application of it, right? But historically, what's going on is that they purge the house of God, yeah, and then all of a sudden, Jeremiah's father finds something really, really interesting. Go to Second uh, Second Kings chapter twenty-two. Second Kings chapter twenty-two. Why does Jehoiah, uh, Josiah, Jehoiah, why does Josiah decide to hold the Passover? Yeah, he's king. He wants to rule. He has all the gold. But for some reason, he's convicted now. He's convicted. Second Kings chapter twenty-two, and verse eight. 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 8, and it says, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah's father, and Hilkiah, the high priest, said unto Shaphan the scribe, 
I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. And as you keep reading, you'll find here that uh, it gets delivered into King Josiah and Josiah hears it. He hears the words of God and something happens to him. Look at verse 13 and it says, okay, so after Josiah hears it, right? Look at verse 10 and it says, And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And what happens? Verse 11, And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. Verse 13, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that is written concerning us. He knows that Israel has sinned. And he rents his clothes, and he knows the wrath of God is upon Israel. And it's coming. And it's coming. Now what's interesting is that, I mean, honestly, you guys know that I'm about, we're about to be parents, right? And it's really important to raise your kids in a Bible-believing home. Amen. And you'll find it here. Because Josiah, yeah, he's a king now, but his fathers before, they messed it up. They messed it up for him. And they messed it up for all of Israel. Why? Because the fathers did not read the book of the law. They didn't read it. Look at verse 14. So you'll see what happens. Uh, Josiah, he wants to hear from God. And it says, that, So Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam, and Akbor, and Shaphan, and Asahiah went unto Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe, now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they communed with her. And she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell that, uh, the man that sent you to me, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read, because they have forsaken me, and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place, and shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, which sent you to, uh, to inquire of the Lord, thus shall ye say to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard. Now look at verse 19. This is really important. It says, Because thine heart was tender, yeah. and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord when thou heardest what I speak, spake against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me. Before me I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore I will gather thee unto the, thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace. You know, the wrath of God does not come upon Josiah. You know, the fathers messed it up for all Israel, but because, what did it say in verse 19? Because his heart was tender towards God, and he humbled himself. Now, believe it or not, in this world, the Antichrist is coming no matter what we do. But if you got a tender heart towards God, and you get saved, that's, that's, that's the bottom line. If you get saved... And you have a tender heart towards Jesus Christ and what he did, then guess what? The wrath of God will pass. It'll, it'll, it'll pass, right? Amen. It'll pass. Right, now let's just keep going here. So you'll find out that Josiah, he, Israel right now is at the, at, a, at the best that it could ever get in the situation that was set up for them. Now go back to, go to 2 Kings chapter 23. Now, what does he do before he, he holds the Passover? He hears about the wrath of God. So what does he do in the 18th year of his reign? Before he holds the Passover, <clears throat> what happens is that he decides to purge Israel again. He does it again. Now, go, keep your hand at, uh, go to 1 Kings 13, but hold your hand at... at uh, uh, 2 Kings 23, what happens is, what's interesting is that this is, a, if you ever want to prove the power of, his prop, of God's prophecy, by the way, uh, Dr. Ruckman always talks about how, you know, there's other prophets that, 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 that are like maybe 99% sure, but if you want to know about the, the, the certainty of God's word, this is one of the greatest things here, is that how, how specific God is and with his answers to prophecy as well. Second, uh, 1 Kings 13, 2 and 3, before Josiah ever comes, he's actually prophesied. 
It's, it's prophesied that Josiah the king is going to come. 1 Kings chapter 13, verse, go look at verse 1. And it says, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jerob, Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar and the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt unto thee. Let's go. Let's see what. Let's see this prophecy be fulfilled. Second uh, Kings chapter twenty-three. Second Kings chapter twenty-three. And just just this whole chapter, you'll see the purging of Israel before the Passover. But let's see the prophecy fulfilled. Second Kings chapter twenty-three and verse fifteen, and it says, Moreover. The altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, hath, had made both that altar and the high place. He brake down and burned the high place and stamped it into small powder and burned the grove. And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. And you'll just keep reading reading these things, and, 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 and basically, man, Josiah doesn't play. Josiah does not play. He purges Israel of all the idols, of all the priests, and he kills them. He kills them all because God doesn't play, because God is holy, all right? Now, let's see, let's see the seriousness of this Passover right here. Second Chronicles chapter 35. Okay, we're going to keep going back and forth, right? Second Chronicles chapter 35 and verse 7. Now, the Bible says that this Passover was the biggest that was ever before or will ever be, right? Second, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 35, look at verse 1. And it says, Moreover, Josiah kept a Passover unto the Lord in Jerusalem, and they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. And he set the priests in their charges and encouraged them to the service of the house. You'll see the, the, the job of the, the Levites. But let's see how, many, how big this sacrifice was. Verse 18. Verse 18. And it says, And there was no Passover like to, uh, to that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet, neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept, and the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel that were present, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And, and in the 18th year of the reign of Josiah, which this, was this kept? Oh, excuse me. Was this Passover kept? I'm sorry. I'm trying to look for the, the amount of... <laughs> of how big the sacrifice was. But anyway, if, if you guys ever find it, what you'll come to find is that how, how big the sacrifice was or this Passover was is that 30,000 lambs and kids, which are young goats, 30,000 of those uh, animals were killed and 3,000 bullocks were slain just for the sacrifice for the Passover. And that's huge. And that's big. That's big, right? Now, uh, now go to verse 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. All right, so... Verse 7. Oh, verse 7? Yeah, appreciate it. Let's go ahead and look over it. Thank you, brother. Verse 7. <clears throat> Thank you. And it says, And Josiah gave to the people of the flock lambs and kids. By the way, it's young goats. It's baby goats. All right. All for the Passover offerings for all that were present to the number of 30,000 and 3,000 bullocks. These were of the king's substance. And look at verse 8, by the way. And it says, And his princes gave willingly. Willingly. Man, what a good Passover. They willingly gave to the Lord. You know why? Because this man right here. Because this man found the book of the law. He found it. Man, if it wasn't for that book, man, praise the Lord, there would be no Passover. There would be no salvation, by the way. I mean, obviously, Jesus Christ died, buried, and resurrected, right? But this book gives us a huge insight. Okay. Now, 2 Chronicles chapter 35, thank you, brother. Verse 20, verse 20. Now, you'll find in the 31st year of Josiah's reign, Josiah dies in battle. He dies in battle. Verse 20. And it says, And after all, uh, and after all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by uh, Euphrates. And Josiah went out against him. Now, you know, when you're reading this, it's interesting is that Josiah 
had nothing to do with this battle. He had nothing to do with uh, Pharaoh's fight against Carchemish, right? And verse 21, but it says, But when he sent ambassadors to him, saying, What have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. For God commanded me, that's Pharaoh speaking, by the way, for, uh, for God commanded me to make haste, forbear thee from meddling with God, who is with me, that he des destroy thee not. Verse 22, what does he do as a good king? Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself, that he might fight with him, and hearken not unto the words of Nico from the mouth of God, and came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. Verse 23, and the, alt, uh, and the archers shot at King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am sore wounded. And he'll come to find out that he ends up dying. Now, in this Christian life, we're going to have some battles, right? We're going to have battles. But the truth of the matter is, is that not all of them are yours. That's right. Not all of them are your battles. You know, there's, there's people that are going through certain things, and you think that you know the book. You think that, you know, you're praying all the time. You have a good relationship with God, but God is dealing with them the way you wouldn't. Yeah. So there's certain times where you got to leave that person alone. Right. Leave them alone. Because at the end of the day, you're going to be making it worse, and you're going to be the one that dies in battle when you shouldn't have. You should not have died. And Josiah, he would have reigned longer than 31 years, and he would have had a longer Passover, and Israel may have, may have prospered. God's wrath would have been delayed, but guess what? He chose, he chose the wrong battle. So you guys got to choose your battles. Choose them. Choose them wisely. Look at verse 25, and it says, And Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. And, and all the singing men and the singing women spake of Josiah and their lamentations to this day and made them an ordinance in Israel. And behold, they are written in the Lamentations. They're written. Right? So we'll go to our next king. Our next king is actually, um, I'll just briefly mention him. His name is Jehoahaz. Verse, chapter 36 and verse 1. And it says, Then the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and made him king in his father's stead in Jerusalem. Jehoahaz was twenty and three years old. These are young men. When he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem, and the king of Egypt put him down at Jerusalem and condemned in the, uh, the land, and an hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold, and the king made Eliakim, right? So this guy ends up reigning, and when you read about this gentleman, he, he, he does evil in the sight of the Lord. And Nico comes in, Pharaoh comes in, which is a type, uh, he comes obviously from Egypt, and he comes in, and then he takes Jehoahaz after three months of reigning. And then he puts his brother in. His name is originally Eliakim. And then you'll find here that uh, the Pharaoh changes Eliakim's name in verse 4 to Jehoiakim. Right? And the king of Egypt made Eliakim his brother, king over Ju uh, Judah and Jerusalem, and turned his name to Jehoiakim. And Nico took Jehoahaz, the brother, and carried him to Egypt. And you'll find out that he ends up dying in Egypt. Now, what's interesting here is that isn't, isn't Egypt a type of the world, right? When you're reading about these kings, when they do evil in the sight of the Lord, is that once you do evil in the sight of the Lord, when, when God doesn't have a hold of you, then guess what the world does? The world has a hold of you. And what does this world do? It changes your name. It changes your name, and the world decides who reigns in your heart. The world decides who reigns on the throne. Amen. Got to be careful, Christian. Okay. Jehoahaz reigns. Okay. He dies in Egypt. Okay. Sorry, it's a, it's a mess. Now, okay, let's look at Jehoiakim, right? So he ends up being 25 years. And he reigns in, uh, for 11 years, right? Go back to Jeremiah chapter 1 again. Or no, I'll just read it. Keep your hand at 2 Chronicles and 2 Kings, right? Uh, Jeremiah 1, 2, it says, 1, 3, and it says, And it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah. So then the word of the Lord is coming. He, it, it's, it, it's, it's raining through here this whole time, <laughs> right? But we're just going to keep looking at, the, at this timeline. Now, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 4 and 8, we already looked at that. Verse 5, it says, Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, his God, 
and against him came Nebuchadnezzar. Now you'll find here that right here, this is when Nebuchadnezzar comes in. King of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar comes in right here. And it says in the 11th year, verse 6, and it says, And against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in fetters to carry him to Babylon. Now, he doesn't just carry the king away. So you'll notice here he begins to reign, and then in the 11th year, Nebuchadnezzar comes. It says he came up. You'll find in Jeremiah that it's his first year as well, Nebuchadnezzar's first year of reign. Is that he comes up, and you'll find that he actually rebels against Nebuchadnezzar. So go to Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. And all this, all this, is, I know, this is just boring stuff. But you need to understand that this boring stuff, God uses. And it makes Jeremiah so much more clear. Jeremiah 25. And verse... Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 4. Verse 4. I believe this is right. Okay. And it says, And the Lord had sent unto you all his servants and the prophets rising early and sending them, but ye have hearkened not, nor inclined your ear to hear him, or to hear. They said, Turn ye again now every one from his evil way and from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever, and go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them, and provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, and, and I will do you no hurt. Yet ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Verse 8, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and an hissing and perpetual desolation. Now you'll notice here that it's, it's towards this time, but what goes on, if you, if you ever read about Jehoiakim, is that he actually rebels against the, uh, the Lord. So I'm pretty sure that the Lord tells Jeremiah to tell the king, hey, obey the king. Nebuchadnezzar is going to take over, but you better listen to him. But what happens is that Jehoiakim ends up rebelling, and then he gets taken. He gets taken, right? So go back to 2 Chronicles. So 2 Chronicles. Now, you'll notice here that it's not just the king that's taken. There's something else taken, too. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Oh, okay, that's where I wanted to go. And go back to Jeremiah 36 as well. You know, and you'll, you'll see that, you know, the Bible says in Chronicles and Kings that the, uh, that, that the uh, kings did evil in the sight of the Lord, okay? And it always says, and the rest of the acts are in the book of the Kings or in the book of the Chronicles. But you know what? The Lord uses uh, the prophets as well. I kind of want you to see this. Go to Jeremiah 36 and then keep your hand at Second Chronicles. What kind of evil does Jehoiakim do in the eyes of the Lord? Jeremiah chapter 36 and verse 1. And it says, And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah, and all the nations from the day I spake unto thee from the days of Josiah, even this day. Okay, so there's a book that's, that has the words of God written in it, right? But what did Jehoiakim do? Verse 27, and it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after that. What did the king do? The king had burned the roll and the words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of, the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again ro another roll and write in it uh, the former words which that were in the first roll which Jehoiakim the king of, of Judah hath burned. You know what he did? He basically did is that he burned their Bible back then. They, he burned the Word of God. He's like, you know what, God, I, I hear you, but forget it. I don't want to hear it. I, because there's false prophets telling him there's going to be peace in the land. And God's like, no, my wrath is coming. But then this king decided to rebel and burn the Word of God. So then he had to come up. Nebuchadnezzar came up. Second Chronicles chapter 36. And... 
Second Kings. Okay. Okay. Second Chronicles chapter thirty-six and verse nine. So you'll notice here that Nebuchadnezzar takes Jehoiakim for three months, and then he ends up dying in Babylon as well. So another king comes up for a little bit, and his name is Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim, verse 9, And Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months and ten days, so a hundred days, in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And when the year was expired, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the goodly vessels of the house of the Lord and made Zedekiah his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem. And you'll notice what happens here with Jehoiakim as well is that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't just take Jehoiakim. He doesn't just take Jehoiakim as well. He takes the vessels of God that are in the house of God as well. He takes them. What does the Bible say? Um, it says that make sure that you don't lose your full reward. You know what happens when you let the world take over in your hearts and you get lukewarm when you're walking with God? The world will take some things. You'll take some rewards from you. Yeah, that's good. So you better be careful. Now what happens here is that you know there's everything in the house of God and all of a sudden the, the treasures of God uh, and, and the gold and the silver and the precious stones, they're, they're getting taken away. And it's just getting worse and worse for them. It's just getting worse and worse. And then Jehoiakim gets taken. And then all of a sudden right here, um, go to 2 Kings chapter 24. 2 Kings chapter 24. Look at, the, look at the poor state of Israel during this time. And Jeremiah is still preaching, by the way. Jeremiah is still prophesying the whole time. Second Kings 24 and verse 17. Look at verse 15. Okay, we'll just... Okay. Yeah. Verse 12. And... Verse 11. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to king of Babylon. He and his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers and the king of Babylon took him in the 18th year of his reign. And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord as the Lord had said. And he carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes and all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained save the poorest sort of the people of the land. They took away everybody that was, that was able to make Israel prosper again. But you know what? It wasn't him. It wasn't this person. It wasn't just him. God, God used him. But you know what? God's wrath allowed him to take these things away. God's wrath allowed it. Because Israel was the one that was messing up, right? Yeah. Now look at verse 17. Yeah, verse 17. And it says, And the king of Babylon made Mataniah, right here, Mataniah, uh, his father's brother, king in his stead, and changed his name. Remember what happens. Okay, at first it's Egypt, now it's Babylon. Aren't we in mystery Babylon right now? Babylon, the world again, changed the name. It's the same pattern. You want to know the devices of the devil? This is the result. He'll change your name for you. Okay, verse 18. Zedekiah was 20 and one years old. So Zedekiah was 20 and one year, so he's 21 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was uh, Hamutal, uh, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For through the anger of the Lord it came to pass in Jerusalem, and Judah, until he had cast them out of, from his presence, that Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. He rebelled. He rebelled against him. Now go to Second Kings chapter 25. You're already there. And... Okay, so we'll see the results of it again, what happens. Verse 7. What happens when... So God told Ze Jeremiah... Uh, God through Jeremiah told Zedekiah, you better obey because it's my wrath that's upon Israel. And oh, let me see if I wrote it down. Okay, go to Jeremiah 27. This is what's going to make it make sense. Okay. Jeremiah 27. Jeremiah 
Jeremiah 27 and verse 12. Okay. Jeremiah 27, verse 12. And it says, I spake also to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all these words, saying, Bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. Why will ye die, thou and thy people, by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, as the Lord hath spoken against the nation that will not serve the king of Babylon? Therefore, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that speak unto you, saying, Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you. This world is prophesying that you got to live your best life before you die, before it's too late. And those are false prophets out there. Verse 15, For I have not sent them, saith the Lord, yet they prophesy a lie in my name, that I might drive you out, and that ye might perish, ye and the prophets that prophesy against you. But what is... But what does Zedekiah do? God told him, do not rebel. Do not rebel. But what does he do? He ends up rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar, against the word of the Lord. And what happens? Go back to 2 Kings chapter 25. 2 Kings chapter 25 and verse 7. This is the result of a bad father. Verse 6, and says, So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon to Riblah, and they gave judgment upon him, and they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and bound him with fetters of brass, and carried him to Babylon. You know what happens is that they get carried away. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 1. Now you'll notice here too is that when so no, Nebuchadnezzar came up around Jehoiakim's time, and then the Bible says, go to verse 1. It says in the ninth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. In the ninth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, uh, that he came upon Jerusalem, right? And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his hosts against Jerusalem and pitched against it, and they built forts against it round about, and the city was besieged unto the eleventh year of Zedekiah. Lines up. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 3, I believe. It's in the words, uh, the words also came in, in, in the eleventh year of Zedekiah's reign, right? Now this is the last part. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 1 again. Jeremiah chapter 1 and 2 Kings chapter 25. <clears throat> Keep your hand in 2 Kings 25. And then Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 3. Look at the last part. It says... I'll just read verse 3. And it came to pass also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, and then unto the carrying away of Jerusalem, captive, in the fifth month. In the fifth month. Second Kings chapter 25 and verse 8. What is that? What, what is that time right there? What does it say? And it came to pass, well, I'm sorry. What did it say? Okay, verse 8. It says, and in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which is the 19th year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar just keeps ruling. What does he do? In the 19th year of King of Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar, captain of the guard, or Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem. And he burnt the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, and every great man's house burnt he with fire. And all the army of the Chaldees 
that were with the captain of the guard break down the walls of Jerusalem round about. Now the rest of the people that were left in the city and the fugitives that fell away to the king of Babylon with the remnant of the multitude did Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carry away. Now, go look at verse uh, 13. And the pillars of brass that were in the house of the Lord and the bases and the brazen sea that was in the house of the Lord <clears throat> did the Chaldees break in pieces and carry the brass of them to Babylon and the pots and the shovels and the snuffers and the spoons and the vessels of brass wherewith they ministered took them away Everything is gone. Everything is gone. Go to Jeremiah 52. Jeremiah 52. It wasn't just the kings that saw it. Jeremiah 52 and verse 12 says the same thing. Verse 12. Now in the fifth month, in the tenth day of the month, which was the nineteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Neb same thing, right? Burn the houses. Break all the things in pieces. But it wasn't just the things. The people died too. The people were slaughtered. Read the rest of it. Look at verse uh, 15. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away uh, captives, certain of the poor of the people, and the residue of the people that remained in the city, and those that fell away that fell to the king of Babylon, and the rest of the multitude. You know, they're taken captive. You know what happens during this time? In the fifth month, Jeremiah saw the carrying away of captivity of Jerusalem. Now go to Jeremiah chapter 1. This is what made me sad right here. This was the hardest thing right here. You know, it's funny. I, this was meant for a Sunday school. <laughs> and I, preached, I, I, I taught this when it was the first Sunday in this building. You know, because what happened is that we finally got a church building. And we were, we're doing so well. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. <clears throat> Look at verse 6. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. I'm a child. He was a child. From the beginning, from, from the 13th year, all the way here. In the days of Jeremiah, you know what he saw? He saw the rise and fall of Israel. And he saw it before his eyes. And if you guys know anything about Jeremiah, he's known as the weeping prophet. Because after all the prosperity, after all the falling of Israel, nobody listened. But you know what's interesting about Jeremiah? He kept going. He kept going the whole time. He quit one time, but guess what? His convictions were too strong for him. And no matter how many times people didn't listen, no matter how many times people didn't understand him, no matter how many times people would just not look at him, and he ended up getting beat and jailed and all these things, he didn't quit. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Whatever you're going through, Christian, you know what's funny? The, the Lord was with him the whole time. He was, he was with him the whole entire time. 1 Peter chapter 4, right after James, and verse 12. And it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as, th as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. And on their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. I don't think it's strange that things are happening to you, Christian. Now, here's the spiritual application. So imagine this is a timeline, right? Now, picture this as a graph. Imagine this was like a little graph right here. Right? So this is going to be time. 
Now, what if this was actually spiritual prosperity right here? I taught this in, the, uh, in, in a Zoom. There was only a couple people, so. Prosterity, prosperity. I'll just put it like that. Pops. Whatever. Okay. You got it, brother. Yeah. Anyways. So, during this time, it's right here. This is where the spiritual prosperity is at. You know what goes on? The more you let the world take over your life. Your walk with the Lord, yeah. it goes downward until right, you're carried away. Until you're carried away right there. Good, now go to second, I'm going to go to first four, four verses and then I'm done. Second Timothy 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. Now you'll notice here that these are the end of the days of, of, the, of the reign of Jerusalem, right? It's over for them. In terms of their, 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 uh, their city, okay? God is not done with Israel, never. He made a promise, right? Second Timothy chapter. Here's the spiritual application right here. Second Timothy chapter three, verse one. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinence, fierce. Uh, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than uh, pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. For of this sort they were they which creep into the houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lust. They're led away right there. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What's happening? Spiritual decline in this world right now. I go to Luke 17. It's, it's the same pattern. God's wrath has never changed. Luke 17. Verse 26. This is more tribulation right here, but I hope you guys get, get the picture. Verse 26, and it says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until that, uh, the day that Noah entered into the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they besought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom and rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man was revealed. You know, I heard a preaching from Matt Crane, uh, Pastor Matt Crane, and, and he said that, that in Noah's time, that was the first incidence of PTSD right there. Because when Noah got into the ship and the floods are coming, people were knocking on the door. Open up! Open up! I'm, I'm dying! He saw it. He saw it. You know what Jeremiah saw? He saw it. He saw it all. He saw it. Go to Isaiah 1. Isaiah 63 verse 1 and it says who is, that, who is this that cometh from Edom and with dyed garments of Bos, from Basra this that is glorious in his apparel traveling in the greatness of his strength I, I that speak in righteousness mighty to save wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and, why, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat I have trod, trod in the wine press alone and of the people there was none with me and for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will uh, stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart and the year of my redeemed is come. And I, I looked and there was none to help and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me and my fury it upheld me. And I will tread the, down the people in mine anger and make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring them down. I will bring down their strength to the earth. That's Jesus Christ's second coming. And he's coming in wrath, guys. He's coming in his wrath. Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel chapter 38. Whether it's Nebuchadnezzar, whether it's uh, Cyrus of, of Persia, it doesn't matter. It's God's wrath. It's God's wrath. 
And one day Jesus Christ is coming in His wrath. Ezekiel 33 and verse 8. And it says, When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Look at verse 6. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. You guys know that the wrath of God is coming. You guys know the Antichrist is coming. You guys know that they'll, they'll have to go through the tribulation. They'll have, to, uh, uh, they'll have to work for their salvation and they'll be, never be able to make without God. You guys know that, but if you don't tell them right now, they will suffer. And the Bible says, go to Joel 2. The Bible says that their blood shall be upon your hands. Yeah, come on. Now how, you know, I thought about that. How, how, how will God require the wicked's blood at our hands? You know, you guys know we're going to come down with Jesus Christ. And, and guess what? He's not the only one that's going to be covered in blood. I mean, this is just a theory, right? I'm, this isn't exactly doctrine. But what if I were to tell you that when you guys come down with Jesus Christ, their blood, God's going to say, you kill them. Kill them now. Because you didn't tell them. And it's your fault. Tell them. It's required. I need you to kill them for me as a soldier. Joel 2. Verse 1, it says, And before behold, in those days... Oh, that's verse 3, sorry. Chapter 3. Okay. Let's see. Verse... Man, this is, I mean, this is all good. I mean, honestly, on our part, this is exciting. But for the world's part, for those that are lost, it's n this is not fun at all. Verse 1, Blow you the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain... Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and strong. There hath not been uh, ever like ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many. So you'll find out this is going to be us coming down. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 4. Uh, Look at verse 3, it's just so good. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run like the noise of chariots upon the tops of mountains. They shall leap, uh, shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people sit in battle array before their face the people... Uh, shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter into the widow and windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. The stars shall withdraw uh, in their shining, and the Lord shall utter his voice before the, his army, for his camp is very great, and for, for he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and it's very ter uh, terrible. Who can abide it? You know, in our, it, it, it seems so exciting. You're going to be Superman. You're going to be running around, running on walls. You're going to be flying. You're going to be stabbed, and nothing can ever stab you. There's going to be a garden of Eden in front of you and a flame of fire before you, but guess what? On the other person's side, on the other person's perspective, it's a great and terrible day. And you know why? It's because we didn't tell him. It's because we didn't tell him. Amen. This is in the days of Jeremiah. Now remember that first question I asked you. Now, what if I were to tell you that today was going to be the best day of your life? How would you prepare for the worst? Amen.